Hey guys, how are you doing? Good. Doing all right. <laughs> yeah. So I just mentioned to you um, about the project, uh, and it would be wonderful if you would uh, both uh, introduce yourselves and maybe even tell us what is your connection to Trinity University because you are kind of special to us because there is a strong connection there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, introducing yourself, where you are, what you're doing now, really in general, what is the, you know, the, the, the performance or the, the art that you're practicing in this moment. And then we're going to get into more detailed questions. Okay. Um. So I'm Rachel Laven. Um, my connection to Trinity is I'm a, an alumni. I graduated in 2014 uh, with a degree in theater. I know, it's so long ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I am currently living in Leeds, England, um, while my husband, Jacob, gets his um, uh, graduate degree. Um, I'm a performing singer-songwriter, so I typically am on the road um, about probably anywhere from 50 to 100 days of the year. Um, so this has been quite a challenge to transition into being at home all the time and doing concerts all always online. Um, and trans transitioning from live audiences to likes and comments and um, imagining applause. Um, what is, is that all? All the questions? Yeah, well, yeah, what you're doing right now, I guess. Yeah, so I've been focusing on uh, a bit on songwriting and then um, planning for the future, getting back into the studio um, come the fall, hopefully if things open back up, um, and then tours for next year. Um, and then basically rescheduling all of the, the gigs that I had for this year um, to fit next year's schedule, which is going to be a bit of a challenge because um, there's some UK touring that I'll have to move to next year. Uh, when I'm back in the States. So that could add some serious expenses onto the, the tab there. Um, other than that, I'm just songwriting, hanging out at home. That's all. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, my name is Jake Purcell. Uh, like Rachel, I graduated from Trinity, uh, but in 2017 with a degree in theater uh, and a minor in religion. And... Uh, Currently, yes, like Rachel said, we're living in Leeds, England. I am getting my Master's of Arts at the University of Leeds in Applied Theater and Intervention. And uh, currently, I am working on finishing up assignments for my degree, um, which is a lot of um, uh, paper writing and, and research, uh, as well as... Um, just putting together a quick slideshow for one of my assignments that the, the original assignment was a presentation that has now just turned into submitting slides. So that's been interesting to try and make a slideshow that is able to be understood just by the slides and with no vocal um, aspect of it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so my research is around um, relationship trainings and, and how, how theater and theatrical tools and techniques can be used to help uh, particularly university students uh, work through um, figuring out what healthy relationships mean and what unhealthy relationship means and, and um, getting to the heart of that. So I'm doing some case studies around uh, organizations that primarily work with younger people and then I'm going to be looking at how that can be turned into working with university students. Um, and so yeah, I mean a, a part of my original methodology was also going to be doing a workshop with uh, students at the University of Leeds that, that would be kind of a pilot workshop for the ultimate program that I want to develop. Um, but of course that's had to be uh, rethought. Um, and so I'm still hoping to do something of some kind, uh, but it would be online, of course. Um, and, and again, since the research is just focusing on the tools as opposed to the participants, I'm hoping to still be able to get uh, some accurate um, data and, and be able to analyze the, the, those findings. And then I guess not related to the course, um, just as a response to all this craziness that's going on, I, I really felt like I needed to kind of be doing something. 
um, to help people to cope. Um, and so I reached out to my course leader and we um, co-created and co-facilitated a little online workshop uh, with other colleagues from my MA program that was just about um, connection and community and uh, ritual and kind of helping people. You know, we, we originally, I wanted to really specify it to this context and kind of go in with the ultimate goal of like figuring out and identifying ways to help people. Um, but then we, through discussion, you know, we didn't want to come across as preachy or as, oh, look at me, you know, I figured out how to cope. And now, you know, since this works for me, it must work for you, which obviously isn't, isn't right because we all have different coping, coping mechanisms. So instead we just kind of went with the goal of just trying to create connection and community since that's something that a lot of people are, are missing and not feeling right now. Um, and then, and then in certain ways we tried to specify it to the current context of quarantine and lockdown. Um, so that, that was successful. We got some good feedback. Um, and yeah, we'll see, we'll see about, uh, progressing that as well. So you kept both, both of you kept, uh, very busy. So when, when did uh, things change for you in England? So I was on a tour um, through Ireland and, and Holland um, and the UK throughout um, late February and early March. Um, and as we were getting into our last week of concerts, then we started to notice attendance was going down. And we had a lot of no-shows for people that had bought tickets for our shows. Um, and we had thought about even canceling our last show because it was starting to get serious and, and nothing had locked down yet or shut down, but the threat was becoming imminent. Um, and my partner in crime who was on the tour with me, Grace, she lives in Austin. And so she was kind of weary about getting back to the States. Um, and so we got off that tour on March 14th and she flew home on the 15th and immediately went into a two week quarantine, um, at a friend's apartment that she was able to stay by herself for two weeks. So here she'd been spending three weeks in, in, um, the UK and then had to go back and spend another two weeks away from her husband and her pups and her friends. Um, and I got home on the 15th as well and, and went straight into a two week quarantine uh, myself and, and didn't go anywhere for two weeks. Um, and that was kind of the start. I think it was the Monday. We yeah, got, I got home we, on the Saturday or Sunday and that Monday they shut everything down. Actually, well, I think if I remember correctly, that's when you and I started to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And when things were getting really serious, but they didn't officially lock it down until that next Monday, I don't think. Cause we oh, still, that's true. We yeah. stayed because we stayed in for the week and then it wasn't. It yeah, was we stayed week. in for a week, even though we didn't have to just because. I had we, been traveling. Yeah, I'd been through yeah. Heathrow Airport, Amsterdam, Schiphol, um, Dublin Airport, um, across public transportation all through London, um, which was one of the heaviest hit spots in the UK. It still is. Um, and so I'd hit, I'd been in a lot, a lot of hot spots for it. And so I thought, okay, if anybody's going to be carrying it, I could be a, a carrier and I didn't want to get anybody sick. So, um, apart from, except me, she didn't, I, I tried to get her, to ju I tried to get her to just stay. We have two bedrooms. So I tried to get her to just stay in that bedroom, but she wouldn't listen to me. Lies. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> it may not have helped, you know. No. <laughs> Just, we have one bathroom <laughs> and I all our meals. Right, right, right. Well, uh, yes, yes. So uh, how do you think that, uh, how was that handled, uh, the emergency in the UK, from your point of view? We're not looking for uh, any political statement. It's just uh, one thing that we discover in talking is that we, uh, it's very difficult at times to believe what the news, what we read. So these mm -hmm. interviews and this conversation were uh, rather are a way for us also to get um, the information from the people that are leaving those information. Mm -hmm. So how was um, the reaction in, uh, in the UK? I felt like we were a little late to the party. Um, things were getting pretty serious before anything closed down. Um, so I feel like they could have reacted much stricter at a, very, uh, at a much earlier stage. Um, I mean, early on in the lockdown, we, w there's a park, a big park close to us and, and, um, Leeds has a 
a lot of a lot of universities so there's a bunch of young people here um and so unfortunately i mean yeah they just weren't taking it seriously and we we would go for a walk early on in the lockdown and like the 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 official lockdown um and there would still be you know massive uh groups of students out you know clearly clearly you know bigger groups than living you know flatmates basically yeah. um and, and, and you know sharing passing bottles sharing and passing bottles and, and yeah passing joints between themselves and, and and not not really you know obviously not taking it seriously at all um, and it wasn't until like another week or so that they shut the dorms down and sent all the students home and then things started to be taken more seriously now when we go to the park for a run like it's it's dead you yeah. um unless it's a beautiful day and then there's cops paroling the or patrolling the um the grounds and and if you're not moving they break you up and send you home yeah um you have to be kind of constantly in motion or or you know they're they're let people play yeah that's what they said i mean i've had a little bit here and there yeah i've had uh you know one of my buddies i met up with recently you know of course we kept just at a social distance in the street just to chat and he was saying that you know he and his buddy went to the park and they're just kicking the football around and you know a cop came up and said hey you, you you know you need to leave or you need to you know head home and they were like oh i thought we got you know an hour of exercise a day and he and he said yeah but like you need to be constantly moving um but even so we've heard stories like that but then also you know in our walks sometimes we do see people kind of sitting on the grass or kicking a football around so yeah hmm. Really inconsistent. It's not, yeah, it's not very well regulated, I feel like. But I think the big break happened, uh, or when, and all, another reason why people started to take it seriously is because our, um, our minister prime minister, got sick. yeah, got, got sick, Boris Johnson. So he, he was not, uh, I don't think he was really taking it seriously. No, he was um, in and hospital he, shaking hands. He was, weeks. yeah, he was shaking hands at hospitals and saying stuff like, um, you know, oh, I'm going to keep on shaking hands. That's what we do. You know, I, I do that. I shake hands. Uh, and, and then he got sick. He got diagnosed with COVID. So then, you know, he went into quarantine, of course, and, and he was he even, even admitted into, to the hospital. Yeah. He didn't ever get put on a ventilator, but he was put on oxygen in the hospital. Yeah. Um, and at that point, the whole government yeah, like, at that point, you know, did a 180 and, yeah. and got really strict as soon as the prime minister got sick. And we started to get like letters and stuff from the prime minister, you know, which had not been existent before. Um, yeah. yeah. So Johnson, from what we had heard, uh, was the one that was uh, really talking about the herd uh, immunity. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah. that yeah. Do you, in, the, in the timeline that you gave us, <clears throat> when was, when did that happen? Before the 15th of March? After I, I personally don't remember, but I remember listening to him and thinking, yeah. "Oh my gosh, this is crazy." That happened. He was after. preaching. Well, he was preaching herd immunity since the beginning, since we first yeah. heard about COVID nineteen, and it got to London, and you know was spreading like wildfire. Um, he was preaching herd immunity. I think until he got sick, he was preaching herd immunity. Which was maybe like the last part of March or early April um, when he got sick. He got sick in, in late March, I think, um, and has since, I think in the last few days, returned to, to work. Um, so I think it was probably, I, I don't know the exact date, but late March that, that things started to turn around and he, I think, realized that herd immunity was not going to fix this. Um, and a lot of, the, that was a lot of the time that the research was coming out saying like, this is unprecedented, things need to shut down. Yeah. Um, this but even like, I mean, are even when, <clears throat> even when, you know, everything shut down except the, you know, grocery stores and other essential businesses, uh, even then it didn't seem like it, it was being taken super seriously. I mean, like when, you know, we were talking with our families in the States uh, and, and they're saying, oh yeah, there's lines outside the grocery stores. They're only letting in a certain amount of people. Like, that took that took a while. Yeah, in. it's like the UK was just like behind everyone else. They're like, oh, we, you know, everyone else shuts down. Two weeks later, oh, we need to shut down. Everyone else is doing, you know, lines outside the store, grocery stores, putting, you know, protective screens up between you and the cashiers. You know, that took a couple more weeks for. And for it's it to understandable start to that it takes time for people to implement things, businesses to implement 
changes. Um, but it just didn't happen. It didn't happen fast, fast enough. enough. <laughs> um, but the H E B has gotten a lot of praise because they have been on top of this since before the virus. Like they've been planning for a virus and a pandemic since before the, any of this happened. So they're yeah. getting a lot of praise for that. But I don't think a lot of the major companies in, this, in the UK were prepared for this at all. So how bad was uh, Leeds hit by the virus? It's, I think we're kind of keeping in, in um, ranks with San Antonio in terms of numbers, except that our population is about a quarter of the size of San Antonio. Mm. So it is a, a bit worse per capita um, for Leeds, but I think we have about the same number of cases. Um, so I think we're, I haven't checked in the last few days, but last I checked a couple days ago, it was at like 1400 cases. Um, and I think around 20 to 40 people that have died from it here. Um, yeah. So Leeds has not been hit as bad as some of the other major metropolitan areas in the UK. And um, London, of course, being the, our New York City in terms of. Yeah. Well. But Leeds is also, it, we don't have an underground or a subway system. Um, our population is not that large, so space is not as big of an issue. Um, and most people drive. There's, there is public transportation with the buses, but those have been dead. I mean, they still run, but you look inside them and no one's, you know, maybe one or two people are riding the bus. Yeah. And you even during busy times, yeah. the buses are not, they're never full. They're not, never packed to the brim. Really? And if, yeah, you, we don't see anybody waiting at bus stops, which yeah. before there was, there's always people waiting at bus stops. You know? Yeah. But even like when things were in full functioning order, I never got on a bus that was overly packed that I couldn't even find a seat kind of thing you know it's not like the the london tube yeah you know so. so as artists how is that impacting you uh, both practically but also mentally emotionally uh, um pretty pretty negatively <laughs> <laughs> um i haven't been as creative as i i would hope um i'm kind of in a constant state of anxiety, um, which has been difficult to be productive. Um, and I also feel like glued to the news, uh, which is never good um, and just kind of fuels that anxiety. Um, so I haven't been as productive as I'd like to be. Um, the online concerts have kind of kept me sane and, and given me something to look forward to, um, which has been nice, um, but it, it doesn't compare to live performance for an audience at all <laughs> in terms of what you get back from it i clap i applaud you though you do applaud <laughs> me, but it's just you <laughs> um it is helpful uh to to read people's comments and and you know see the likes but it's not the human interaction and the connection that you have from a live performance typically um and i miss that a lot i miss talking to audiences after the show and shaking hands and giving hugs and seeing old friends and making new friends and having a drink at the bar afterwards and, you know, shooting the shit with the bartenders. I miss that part. So I miss drinks at bars. So what, uh, what, uh, <laughs> what, is it, what is it now? Can it's you explain like to, us, to us that we don't know what you mean? What is an uh, online concert? Online concerts, um, I'm using the platform of Facebook Live. Um, and so it's, it's me just like this in front of a screen um, with my instrument. And I play a song and sometimes Jake will be listening in and, and he'll clap for me to kind of give me that same, just kind of timing and, and the sensibility you. and support. Um, but now, you know, I'm, I've gotten to a point where J and Jake is great for this. He'll, he'll navigate the comments while I'm performing. Cause I realized the first couple of times that I did it, that I would get distracted by the comments and the likes and the hearts and the, all the things that are removing on the screen. I would get really distracted by that and I would forget lyrics and I'd um, lose track in the song and, and, you know, just mess up a lot. Um, and then I would lose track in my stories and in the banter in between and just get completely sidetracked by comments. So I got to a point where Jake now navigates the comments for me and will tell me like, okay, so-and-so has requested this song um, or so-and-so says this and I'll kind of turn to him every once in a while on the show and be like, and now an update from the comments, you know, can you give me a little bit on, on what people are saying? Um, so I don't have to pay attention to that and just kind of can kind of stay in the moment and, and 
do the best performance yeah. I can. But the other day you you did a like just a recorded show too. Oh yes, yeah. okay. so there's there's a, a a handful of venues that are now doing um, performances via YouTube, um, and they're basically having you record songs ahead of time. Basically, record a whole performance. <laughs> and then turn that in. And so I did that for a, a house concert in um, Johnson City, Texas, that I'd played last year. Um, what is and so I recorded a, a 40 minute set. What I'm is sorry? a house concert? A house concert is, it's a concert in your home. So anybody can invite an artist to come to their home and they can invite all of their friends or open it up to the public depending on on what their their capacity is and what their, you know, preferences. Some people don't want complete strangers in their home. Some people have a lot of friends that they want to entertain and, and make it a party situation. But basically you have an artist come into your home and they perform for either your friends or for the general public if you're willing to welcome people into your home. Um, and they typically will spend a little bit more than you might going to a venue, um, especially in, in places um, in the, some of the major cities. A lot of the places don't charge to get in the door. And so house concerts, typically they charge between 10 and, and $20 per head for somebody to come in. Um, and you basically get a very, very intimate um, concert. Okay. It's usually anywhere from 10 to 50 people. Um, so it's a much more intimate setting. Um, there's a lot more room for conversation. Typically you, you, you get to meet the artist and talk to the artist before and after the show. Um, Oftentimes they do a potluck dinner, so people bring food and you enjoy food and wine with people. Um, so it's a much more intimate setting. And that, I absolutely love doing them because I get a stronger connection with people and, and would much rather be able to see my audience and, and engage with them. Um, so I really love it. But they've got them all over the world and anybody can do it. Um, there's people that, that are, you know, religious with it and like do it every month and, you know, have thousands of followers and, you know, sell tickets and sell out, you know, 60 seats and stuff like that. And then there's people that are like, well, I'm having a party this weekend. You guys come on over and bring some wine, bring some food, and we're going to have a good old time. Um, so that's a house concert. Okay, great. Yeah. So in terms of your uh, concerts on the Facebook Live, mm -hmm. well, they are live. Mm -hmm. Typically, there yeah. Is, there is a, a, a connection with the audience because they, they write comments. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what's missing? Um, the applause. The applause and the, the kind of instant gratification of, of, you know, you say something funny and you hear the laughter. Or you say something meaningful and you see somebody tear up. You know, you don't, there's not, you can't see them. You can see their comments, you can see what they say. Um, but there's not that human interaction of seeing somebody's reaction to your songs and seeing their reaction to your story um, and then being able to come up to you after the show and, you know, tell you about their, grand their grandmother's item that you were given, you know, and their, their version of your story, um, which is my favorite thing. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest thing of what's missing. And I, some people are doing Zoom meetings um, and doing concerts over Zoom where they can see their audience. I haven't played around with that yet. Um, Oftentimes the quality isn't as good. So I know a lot of people are struggling with that, but it is something I've definitely considered um, to try to get a little bit more engagement. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting to think about like the one type of interaction that you do have with Facebook Live is like being able to see like people are able to talk to you while you're performing, which is like <laughs> not a kind so of, hard. it's like, and it's not a kind of, like I was even just now thinking about it and thinking, oh yeah, that's not the kind of interaction that is able to take place during a show. I mean, sure. Unless in, you're a heckler. In, well, but in, and in <laughs> it's between, like heckling, constant heckling. Yeah, in between, for, you know, songs, maybe someone yeah. will have an interaction, but to have this constant ability for people to just say, oh, I want to say something, that, 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 uh, you know, is, is completely new. So that's interesting to think about. Yeah. So do, do you think, just saying with you, Rachel, uh, for one second, do you think that uh, you know these um, kind of uh, innovations that were already present in the, before the COVID nineteen, of course, but uh, can uh, can can you learn what what did you learn from this and what can you then use even in the future and how do you see your you know uh, art going and um, because that's also actually that's the most important part of this conversation for 
for me mm. personally to understand how the artist is looking at this and try to figure out, of course, we don't have an answer. You, you may not, you, you know, it's a, it's a, but this process is a quite illuminating for us all. Mm. So what's happening in this process so, for you? I've never, I've never really delved into online concerts at all before. Um, a lot of my peers have, and they do them pretty regularly. Um, but I had never had never really done them. Um, and so that's been a bit of a learning curve, just kind of getting the the technology down um, and how to work everything and, and get a good sound and get a good picture and good lighting and, and um, you know, all the different platforms that you can use. Um, so that's been uh, educational. <laughs> um, I definitely prefer live performance to online, um, but I think it'll be a tool for me to have in the future um, to fall back on. If there's a time when I can't be out touring, um, I have this platform. Um, I think one of the other cool things about it is that I have people that can't come see me perform live because I live in England and they live in America or because I haven't toured through their city in years um, or they're homebound and can't go out to a show or they have kids and they can't make it to a show because they can't find a babysitter. Um, and I've been able to connect with them again. And that's been something that's been really special. Um, I have some friends that, that are in hospital and they've tuned in and, and watched. Um, our friends in nursing homes that have tuned in and watched. Um, and that's been really cool to, to be able to perform for them again. Um, and then also just to stay connected with, with people back in the States while I'm here. Um, it's been really nice to, to be able to perform for my parents who haven't gotten to see me perform in, in months. Um, so that's been, that's been a really sweet way of engaging with people. Um, so I definitely will hold on to that and definitely use that in the future. So how do you deal with the fact that, well, you said that uh, you're not being very creative because you are in a constant state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. This for an artist is, uh, is a challenge, troubling, I would say, yeah. and challenging. But often, <laughs> often from these kind of challenges, we go do create something fantastic. But how are you dealing with that? Because I know you are being very creative, consistently creative. Um, uh it's often a matter of force. <laughs> um, yeah. I have to kind of force myself to, to turn my phone off and, and go sit down with my guitar for a while. Um, and that, that in itself is a challenge, uh, let alone anything coming out. Why is, it, why is that a challenge? What, uh, what is challenging? Um, social media is very addictive. Oh, um, yes. And being able to turn off Facebook and turn off that constant feed of new information um, and games and, you know, random crap that's going around on Facebook, getting into arguments with people that have different political beliefs than you, <laughs> things like that is very addictive um, and kind of feeds the need, that anxiety, that anxiety yeah. and that need for information um, and that hope that something miraculous is going to come. Um, so that in itself is a challenge to, to break away from that and, and focus on something creative. Um, also just, just the kind of general depression that comes along with anxiety and being able to get off the couch, finding the motivation to get off the couch and turn your head away from Netflix and social media to, to do something productive is difficult. Um, I you know we both have a lot of friends that can barely get out of bed right now. Um, so just kind of battling that sort of thing um, is difficult. Um, I've dealt with depression and anxiety for quite some time now. And so this has just kind of been another dip um, an exasperating kind of experience. Um, I don't know if that's the word we're looking for. It's, it's, it's yeah. a big word. That I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly. another, another challenge. Um, it's kind of fighting off the depression to, to do it. Um, but what's been helpful is, is listening to other people's music and, and trying to learn techniques. I've been trying to turn my focus when I can't be necessarily in songwriting mode or creative or, or real creative output, um, I'm trying to be more on input. Um, so I'm taking a, a class um, on artist development that's kind of working through some of the more business side of things um, and the more practice side of things. So um, being able to watch videos on, on some of my heroes performing and playing and then trying to you know imitate what they're doing on guitar or learning a new technique that they're doing. Um, has been really helpful. So kind of working on my craft as opposed to necessarily creating something new um, has been useful. 
Right. I'm just trying to get better, getting better at guitar and getting better at, at vocalizing and singing and, you know, everything else. So that's kind and of that, what I my attention to. And now you've got some time to do that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Normally I wouldn't have that time. So there's that. So Jake, what about you? How you, what's happening to your art? And of course you are in school, but still an artist, still doing the practicing it. So it doesn't change being outside or inside. You are actually doing it. Uh, so I know I, you explained to us how it has impacted you in your work, uh, but uh, we would like to know a little bit more not just the practical aspect, but what is happening in your mind as you, you know, as Rachel has mentioned it, you know, what you're trying to, what you're doing, you know, you're doing a slide show without words. I know that's a challenge in itself. Uh, but also the, you know, where, where do you see this? Uh, uh, what are you learning from this? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess when this first happened, um, and you know it was clear that this was going to have you know be a, a massive impact uh i honestly honestly roberto i thought back to i think something that you had told me um at university and and uh or maybe at, at when we were in italy or something and you'd said that like you know as an artist we constantly need to be aware of current events and we constantly need to be, you know, thinking about how we want to respond to those. Uh, and so, so that's, you know, where that came from is I thought back to that conversation we'd had and I thought back to, uh, you know, okay, how, you know, exactly like what you said, how am I going to respond to this crazy, um, crazy situation? Uh, and then I started thinking about, okay, well, in my mind, I guess the healthiest way for me to think of it um, was to think about it as, okay, this is the new normal. Um, and, and we can't sit around and wait until things go back to the previous, you know, way of normality. Uh, and so if this is the new normal, how am I going to still um, you know, do forum theater projects? How am I still going to be able to connect with university students and, and help university students with their academic experience? Uh, you know, so I, right away then, I started to just think uh, and do research on online facilitation. Uh, and I found a good source called Training for Change, um, which is a source, uh, a resource for grassroots movements and activists uh, to kind of connect with people in, in different locations, uh, you know, through, through virtual means. Um, so that was helpful. And I just started to think about um, then, you know, through this process with the, my course leader, how to uh, approach the subject and, and we shouldn't approach it with the complex of, oh, I have everything figured out because I am very conscious, like Rachel said, uh, you know, a lot of our friends, a lot of my classmates um, aren't able to, you know, get out of bed and they're just not able to function. One of my classmates completely dropped out of the course, even though, you know, she only had like two or three more assignments left. Um, you know, she was pretty much 75% of the way done. And, and then this all happened and she completely dropped out. Um, so I know, you know, a lot of the students too are having to live back at home with their parents, um, you know, which is difficult for any person in their young to mid 20s or any, any age, I guess, to uh, <laughs> go back and, and be living with their parents after, you know, several years of not living with your parents. Um, so it, it's understandable, but then, you know, I'm very conscious of the fact that, you know, I am able to uh, you know, my, my mental health, thankfully, hasn't uh, got taken a big hit yet. Um, and, and I think this, the schoolwork and the coursework has uh, helped me in that because I just have kind of thrown myself into that and used that to focus. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I'm trying to think back to the original question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm really just trying to think, uh, constantly think of if this is the new normal, how am I going to be able to continue to do the work that I want to be doing and the work that I feel called to do? 
Um, and then, you know, it, it, thinking of that, you know, kind of thinking of it in my mind, this is how it works anyway. If I think about that, that, you know, okay, this is the worst case scenario and this is how it's going to be. And this is the new normal actually. And then if I think about that, it helps me kind of focus on being able to, to, uh, experiment and adapt with that craft. Thank you. Um, and then, and then just like Rachel said, if it, you know, some things do go back to normal eventually, then we've, we've done work that will, I'll still be able to use what I'm using right now. It's not like this is only valid in this context. And that's another reason why I, I, I'm thinking that this is really useful to be thinking about, because if I am able to start meeting together in person, I, I'll have this experience and this, uh, um, expertise of meeting and facilitating online so that I would be able to connect with people in, in a whole different way uh, and, and be able to make it kind of a, a worldwide movement, if you will, and be able to connect with people from different cultures at the same time. So that's exciting to me. Um, yeah. Great. So one thing I forgot to mention to you, both of you before, is that one of the objectives of this work that we are doing, performing human rights, and uh, why we are also talking to the artists, is that uh, through our conversations with the team, with the students and uh, the colleagues, we realize that one of, that of course there are no, in this moment we don't know what's happening, but one thing we, we can do, and that is exactly what we are doing, recording what is happening and documenting what is happening so that when this is over, because it's going to be over, but although you are right, this could be the new normal or a version of this it could be the new normal. But there is a moment of um, when we're gonna accept it as being that's what it is, in which we f want this work to become a memory, a memory of what happened so that as artists, we are accomplishing one of our objectives to, to create these memories for people to remember how it was. Because it's not, uh, this is not only bad or, or good. I mean, there, there is a variety of reactions that is, a variety of stuff is happening in this moment. It's so rich. It's so rich, this moment, that we feel to, to record. And of course, we want to record what is happening with, uh, with the human rights, whether or not you know, people have been uh, protected or, uh, you know, at uh, the same rights because, you know, I feel I, I am a privileged person. I am in my backyard talking to you guys and um, not everybody has the fortune that I have. So as a role for the artists, that's what we want to do, to, to document, create and, re, and create a memory and remind people, hey, that's what it was. Um, so that's our role. What, what do you think is then your role in the, what is happening now? And I, I know, I understand you are coping. I want to a little, you know, I like to push you a little bit, both of you. In this moment, you, are, you have a gift, you have a, a talent, right? And you know, you're, you're lucky because you got that gift. It doesn't come free. We have to give back, right? right? So and we give back with the role that we have in, in communities or in, in, in our craft. So just for this, is our, really it's gonna be the wrapping up uh, uh, question for me and uh, for you guys. And uh, so what, what do you think is uh, your role? We don't know, we know that, we don't know, okay? We, we know that we don't know, but improvise. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go first? Sure. I've gone first this whole time. <laughs> well, now you put me on the spot. Well, uh, let me improvise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I think my role is, and this is exactly what prompted me in in try in creating that online workshop. And, and you know, I want to progress that and, and open it up to you know more than just my 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 fellow colleagues. Um, I feel like my role with the talents and, and the tools that I know and the tools and techniques that I'm you know, still learning in school, um, I feel like I can help people cope. And, and I can, if, if I can reach people, I can help them through 
this. And, and again, that idea of, you know, it's crazy to think about how we're all separated right now. Yeah, maybe we're with our families, but, you know, we're all in this quarantine, in this lockdown, right? And that makes us feel like we're alone. And it makes us feel so isolated and people really struggle with that, right? But really, if you think about it and picturing the whole world in mind, that makes us all one big community because we are all for once in the same situation, you right. know, no matter how privileged you are. Um, like you said, you know, we're, we're, all three of us are, are very privileged. Unfortunately, we don't have a yard to sit in, but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're it. but still where we have a roof over our heads, you know, and, and we're, we're not, uh, lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, this, this is really then for once kind of put everyone, regardless of your social status, regardless of your race, your religion, you know, all those societal structures, and we're, we're all, you know, for the most part in the same situation. And so if, if I can help people to see that and build a sense of community through that way, I think it would really help people to, to cope. So that's, that's kind of what, I, what I'm looking at my role as. I don't know that I've necessarily... Um necessarily found my role yet. Um, I know where my talents lie. And I, I think right now, um, my main contribution is, is, is distraction. Um, my performances and performing online and, and, you know, social media posts and things like that, um, are a, a, a pleasant distraction. I hope they're a pleasant distraction. Uh, I like to think it's a pleasant distraction. <laughs> um, I think down the line, my role is going to be more on, on the, the capturing the memory of it and capturing the, the emotion of it in my songwriting, um, which I haven't written any, I mean, I've written songs that are relevant right now, but they're not about this yet. Um, but I know that they, they will come and they'll come for a lot of songwriters. Um, and I think that's one of the amazing things about songwriting is, is the ability to capture an emotion in a time and a moment um, with lyrics. Uh, and with music. And so I'm hoping that, that that'll eventually be my contribution to this. Um, but for now, I think it's mostly distraction and, and a little bit of community building. Um, I know with the shows, um, and I've been told by people that have watched my shows online that I am very engaging and that I am, um, it feels like you're in the same room with me when I perform even online. And that's, that's a skill that I really right now because that's if there's anything that I want to be able to do it's that it's to be able to reach people through a screen um which can be difficult um I have friends that are really struggling because they can't cope with the screen and the difference um and so that's something that I've been working on and developing um but then just just keeping as genuine and and human as possible in my performance um, and I think people are, are engaged with that and they're they're responding uh, well to that. So hopefully I'm uh, able to build a sense of community and, and um, yeah, a sense of community even through the screen. Yeah. Well, I'm special. I, th I think you do that automatically because people see when other friends start to watch and they say, oh, Becky's here. Oh, mm -hmm. so-and-so's here. Even if it's just yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And they're talking to each other in the comments and that's always really cool to go back. Starting to community. Yeah, well, it's good to go back once I'm done with a performance and don't have to think about it and remember what what lyric I'm on and what chord I'm playing. Um, it's nice to go back and see how people talked and, you know, chatted with each other in the comments um, during the performance, stuff like that. That's really special, too. So that's been good. Wonderful. Well, thank you, guys. Um, since uh, some members of our Trinity community is going to watch this, any words for them? You are, you are part of this community. You are out there really in the wild right now. Uh, the students uh, have gone through this, your same experience, Jake, because they found themselves. And I, I know I cannot express how they are, they are feeling, but as being, you know, you know what. So any, any thoughts you, you would like to share with, the, with our, our community before we, we part and, um, and of course, this video is going to be, I'm going to share you uh, all the, in the drive with this video is going to stay. So you also will be able to 
access the videos of conversations with other artists if you like to. Okay. Yeah, very, very illuminating as it was this one. So any parting words from you two? Um, mostly to stay strong through all of this um, and know that your, your Trinity community is a massive one and goes far beyond the stretches of the brick walls that you are surrounded by. Um, there are people in every major city in the world that, that are thinking about you and love you and are going to be there for you when you graduate um, to help you along on your path, um, us included. Any way we can help you, we're happy to. Um, and that you can survive doing your art. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> you can be financially <laughs> stable doing your art. We promise we're doing it. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just, uh, I guess, want to thank thank the team and and the group that's doing this. Um, and and uh, as alumni, uh, we're we're proud, I guess, too, uh, of of the work that y'all are doing. And it's it was therapeutic for I don't know about for you, but it was therapeutic for me to talk about these things and to kind of get get it get thinking about them uh, and speak speak our truth as well. Um, so yeah, I just, like Rachel said, I reiterate, stay strong. And, uh, this is a really exciting project too, that, uh, you know, is, is going to last. It's going to be, uh, have a lasting effect. So good job. Thank you guys. Well, you know that we are here for you too. We love you. Bye.